There were more women in the classes. There just weren't many women of color. Economics has seen a rise in female researchers in recent years, especially in wealthy Western countries. But in so many other places, Africa, for example, economics is still a man's world. We have to do something about this. It's so rare to see women, in, not just in the university world, but even in central banks, in a lot of policy-making institutions. There are no women. They're absent. Una Usili is one of the few African women to buck that trend. She's currently the Associate Dean for Research and International Programs at Indiana University and holds the Ephraimson Chair in Economics and Philanthropy. Usili believes drawing more women into economics will mean a future that better reflects African society. Africa is a very young continent. It has the most young people of any continent. And so when we think about where future research is going to come from, new ideas, it's a, it's a very timely question to say, how can we bring more African women into the profession? Journalist Rhoda Metcalf spoke with Dr. Osili about her work and why there aren't more women out there looking to solve Africa's economic challenges. So, I mean, I think it's fair to say that economics is still a fairly male-dominated field and it's geographically concentrated. So that when you look at the African region, and especially to women economists coming out of Africa, the numbers are really tiny. Why is that? And, and what are we losing because so few African women are part of the economics field? Economics, I think, has been shown to have, you could say, a diversity problem. Even here in the United States, we have very few Black economists and very few Black women who are economists. Right. The Numbers I've seen, less than 1%, actually 0.5% of the profession. Wow. Now, when we look at the African continent, I think we see this problem magnified. Economics is still very much a male-dominated profession worldwide, but especially on the African continent. And, and there would surely be advantages in having more African women in the profession. Absolutely. And having women in the research pipeline involved in economics research helps bring new methods and new ideas and new solutions. Sure. When we think about women, especially on the African continent, we also see some other um, gender-related issues magnified. For example, women grow 70% of the food or 70% of the farmers are female farmers. And this plays out in small businesses. A lot of the areas of economic development and economic growth, I think those questions need to be answered, putting a gender lens to the equation. So why is it? I mean, what are the reasons that so few African women become economists? The first is a lack of role models. Okay. In much of the world, the myth is still that economics is a highly technical, specialized discipline and that you need a certain background in order to pursue a career in economics. So a lot of women are counting themselves out. I mean, so if you're a woman, a bright young woman in Africa, and you go to college, what do you study? I grew up in Nigeria. Uh, my parents are both college professors. I grew up on a college campus. Sure. And most bright, young African women, if you're good in school, you're typically steered towards medicine. If you're good okay. in math, if you're good in science, the top professions would be similar to maybe immigrant households here in the United States, medicine, law, maybe engineering would be number three. Okay. So when I uh, mentioned that I was interested in economics, a lot of my teachers in high school said, but you're so smart. Why would you go into economics? Right. Why not medicine? Oh. So that uh, lack of role models, I think, is part of it. I think the second issue um, is that uh, there isn't a pipeline or pathway for a lot of women who may be interested in the profession. So there are a lot of barriers to their pursuing this as a field. I, um, if I could use myself as an example, Please. so many people, when they meet me, they often tell me you're the first person I've ever met who's uh, from Africa, a female economist. And I'm so, I was surprised to hear that maybe 20, 30 years ago, and I'm still getting the same comments. Right. So when you look at the data, the problem hasn't gotten better. In fact, you could say maybe it's even gotten worse. But I mean, if you want to be an economist as a young woman in Africa, are there many options on the continent to do that? 
There are a lot of new uh, pathways for women who want to pursue it on the continent. One example is the African School of Economics that uh, was uh, founded by uh, Professor Leonard Wanchikanon, who's at Princeton University. Um, Where is that university? That's based in West Africa, uh, Republic of Bene, so okay. in West Africa. And um, he's been very intentional about bringing more attention to this issue. Um, but you're raising a very good question that um, historically, a lot of people who want to work in the profession or study or get an advanced degree in economics have had to travel outside the continent. But there are increasingly uh, institutions that have opportunities on the continent. And lots of universities have a track record of producing high quality doctoral students. But but what about research? I mean, is there much economics research happening in African universities? Because to become an effective economist, you really need those research skills too, right? So that's an area where I think things have actually, if anything, uh, there's been more of a backward slide in many African countries in the 1970s and even in the 1980s. The hmm. universities, uh, higher educational institutions were very well resourced. So there were um, faculty members, but they were also plugged into the global research network. Okay. They could attend conferences. There were funds available for that type of exchange and also the work. Increasingly, I think with many of the universities and countries facing financial difficulties, uh, African economists, especially the ones doing the research, are not as well, um, I'd say, plugged in to what you might think of as the research infrastructure. And so I okay. think that poses challenges for people who want to do not just um, excellent research, but also presenting at conferences, building networks with other colleagues in other parts of Africa and the world. So I guess a lot of Africans who do become economists and want to advance their careers, I mean, they essentially have to leave Africa. They go to Europe or the U.S. Right. And this is what uh, has often been called the brain drain, as you know. Um, in the field of economics, I think that does have more dramatic consequences because the people studying those problems are not necessarily the ones living in those countries and experiencing those issues firsthand. Right. And it makes a difference, right? I mean, having that local knowledge of a place when you're trying to find solutions to the problems there, it, 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 it's very useful having that local knowledge. Absolutely. And this is something that um, I, I would say I experienced at a very young age. Um, that's probably what drew me into economics. I was okay. in uh, high school at the time where Nigeria was embarking on this structural adjustment program. Nigeria was an oil producing country. It had gone through a period of prosperity and optimism and now was being um, due to a number of factors, a lot of economic um, challenges and how to navigate this uh, falling oil prices, political instability, and the government did something very unusual. It opened up that question to the public to say, hmm. how should we reform our economy and brought in everyday folks into the debate um, with, of course, uh, some of the national speakers on the stage, but really getting those perspectives. And I think at hmm. that time I was curious, I was inspired by those questions. What's the right exchange rate policy? How should we stay stabilize our currency? What should we do to grow different sectors of our economy? And that was also a moment where I realized that a lot of the knowledge was not being generated locally, that we needed outside experts at that time to tell us about the Nigerian economy. Right. And I, at that moment, sort of felt like I'd like to be part of finding those solutions. So you ended up going to college in the U.S., and I, I guess you continue to be inspired in the classroom to ask those economic questions. In college, I also had some really wonderful uh, faculty members. Uh, my first economics class in college was uh, Amartya Sen's. Wow. It was called Hunger in the Modern World, where we studied famine in the modern world, yeah. but using a very data-driven approach. I didn't have a lot of female economics professors as an undergraduate, but uh, Professor sure. Claudia Golden oh, yeah? was also one of my professors. Wow. So what was the classroom experience like for you? I mean, was it kind of daunting? I, I have to imagine that you were pretty much the only African woman in those classes. 
I think that was not as much of a challenge, especially as an undergraduate, because okay. there were more women in the classes. There just weren't many women of color. Right. And uh, when I look back, all you need is really one person to encourage you. And I was very fortunate because I had one close friend that was a year ahead of me and she loaned me all her econ textbooks so I didn't even have to buy them and she served as a bit of a um, guide because I could talk to her about different classes and so forth. So I think often as you look back it you don't necessarily need um, a multitude of role models you just need one and I think the other side of it is that the field itself was just so fascinating in the opportunities to study really relevant questions. I know that at the very beginning, as a young economist, you started out looking at remittances, right? Exactly. I was very interested in development economics. I was really interested in these questions. What holds countries back? What can be done to make life better for vulnerable households and families? And I was also drawn to questions that hadn't been answered. And one of those questions was remittances. In the 1990s, Many countries were receiving significant sums of funds from their overseas family members, but no one was recording it. I was a graduate student in Chicago, which has a large immigrant population. And so in any of those ethnic neighborhoods, you would see signs and all kinds of uh, infrastructure around sending money home. But if you looked, tried to look up data, no single country at the time was really tracking this. And our international institutions central banks were aware of these flows, but weren't really paying attention. And so my first goal was literally to unpack remittances, to understand that they include, of course, these family transfers. Those are the ones that people know about, but also investment-related transfers, that immigrants are actually making investments in their countries of origin, building houses, Uh, investing in businesses, financial investments. And then the last uh, aspect of these remittances was also fascinating to me because immigrants were also investing in community-based projects. Sometimes it was schooling, education, healthcare, climate. And those were what some people describe as communal remittances. So they were often done in a collective. Interesting. So kind of philanthropic remittances. Exactly. So those initial findings, I think, have been very foundational to my own understanding of how migrants play a role in solving problems, but also how um, these are things that are happening largely outside the sphere of government or even the traditional international development world and community. Right. So from there, I know you then segued into studying the the kind of related field of philanthropy. So in the course of your research, have you found things about philanthropy that surprised you? Absolutely. I think what's been interesting to me is to see the trends over time. I have been um, studying data on philanthropy for the past two decades. When I first joined the faculty at Indiana University, we launched a new project called the Philanthropy Panel Study. It's the longest running Uh, study of American families, we found that uh, two-thirds of Americans gave, and it was very consistent over... Then they gave to... Two charitable organizations. And it was so stable that even during downturns, many households maintained their commitments. However, around the time of the Great Recession, we saw that number start to decline. And today, it's less than half of Americans that give Mm. to charity. So trying to understand that has been a very fascinating question. And then on the global front, we've also been looking at how shocks affect different kinds of flows. And during the most recent pandemic, remittances and philanthropy proved to be the most resilient of all the flows. So we saw private capital flows decline. We also saw foreign direct investment contract significantly in the wake of the pandemic. However, remittances actually increased by about 19%. Right. And private philanthropy stayed relatively stable for the most part. So, I mean, what kind of impact does that have? I mean, how important is philanthropy's role in the economics of the world? Well, I think that the reason philanthropy is an important part of the equation is that it has the flexibility that other forms of support may not. In other words, private donors 
they have agility, they can move relatively quickly, and they can experiment. They don't have uh, election cycles to consider. Right. Uh, one very simple example is when schools shut down around the world, it took uh, several weeks for many uh, countries to actually get laptops to kids so that they could study. And in many communities, it was private donors or community level resources that stepped in. Okay. In Nigeria, for example, private donors and also even local radio stations said, we'll help with uh, broadcasting school instruction until we can get this sorted out. The other place where private philanthropy has been shown to be quite important is in disaster uh, relief, right. cross-border giving for the 47 countries where we can track. Philanthropy makes, about, makes up about 10% of those cross-border flows, $70 billion. But what's important is the nature of philanthropy itself, that um, they can direct the funds in a way that uh, governments may not be able to. Hmm. And as we said, the public sector may also have constraints in being able to address those issues. So besides your research, I know you've also been very involved in trying to encourage more African women to go into economics, right? Yes, yeah, so that's been a really important part of my work, as I mentioned, informally mentoring and supporting other women in the profession and especially African women. Probably about a decade ago, one of my very uh, dear friends, colleagues, uh, there are not many uh, African women in the profession, so we tend to know each other. Professor Elizabeth Asiedu, she's now at Howard University. She spent some time on the continent and she, in her travels around the continent, she's from Ghana originally, she came back and she said, we have to do something about this. Mm. It's so rare to see uh, women, in, not just in the university world, but even in central banks, in a lot of policymaking institutions. There are no women, they're absent. So the first step was to actually set up the Association of African Women Economists. Okay. And what has been, I think, really inspiring about that network is that now when there is someone who's applying to grad school or working on a dissertation, they have someone to reach out to. We have a database that's searchable of all the African women economists. So if someone is an aspiring young, young student, um, female on the continent, they can look up different folks and they can contact your contact information is there. And we've continued to build that database. Nice. And um, there's also been a formal mentoring program so that older female economists are assigned younger economists. So we are still, of course, a growing uh, group. The network is still getting established, but it has already been successful in building that sense of community. Because in the past, you wouldn't have even known where to start. It was like a needle in a haystack, finding someone else that you can relate to who can help you uh, navigate the profession. That's wonderful. So, Una Osili, I really appreciate you taking the time to explain your work, both the mentoring and the research. And thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. It was really a pleasure. I enjoyed our conversation. Una Osili is the Associate Dean for Research and International Programs at Indiana University and holds the Ephraimson Chair in Economics and Philanthropy. She was speaking with Rhoda Metcalf. Look for other podcasts in our Women in Economics series wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on X, which used to be Twitter, at IMF underscore podcast. I'm Bruce Edwards. And I'm Rhoda Metcalf. Thanks for listening.